Good evening. Can you all hear me? We're not starting yet, but we will start in a couple minutes. And I want to make sure everyone in the back can hear my voice. Lights on, but I um, don't. Okay, nope, we're on. <laughs> okay. Welcome to Respond to Racism. My name is Bruce Poinsett. I'm the executive director of the organization, and thank you all for joining us this evening. So, the mission of Respond to Racism for those who this is their first time with us is to educate and empower Lake Oswego residents and institutions with the tools to combat racism in all its forms and make LO and Oregon a better place to live for residents of all races and ethnicities. So we can do these monthly community meetings to hopefully educate you all, engage you in some important conversations, both happening in the community as well as knowledge tonight that can be you know, I guess from not really outside the community, but to broaden our community. So a few uh, housekeeping announcements. Actually, I first should say that one, we're broadcasting tonight from Lake Oswego, which is the ancestral home and land of the Tualatin Band of Kalyupuya tribe, the Clackamas Bands of the Upper Chinook and other native groups. Today, these tribal members are represented by the Confederate tribes of the Grand Ron the Confederate tribes of the Silots Indians, the Confederate tribes of the Warm Springs and other indigenous groups. So we have gotten some feedback that these land acknowledgements are performative and I think it's very valid. But I do wanna share that to say that we are gonna be doing in this next year and this next going forward, a lot more work to actually engage with tribal communities beyond just me getting up here and reading statements for you. So I say that in front of you all so you all can hold us accountable to do that work. Now, a few, uh, before I introduce our speaker tonight, a few housekeeping announcements. First off, the uh, annual MLK celebration for this year is gonna be at Lake Ridge Middle School this Sunday, January 14th. I believe the, it's from one to 4 p.m. Presentations go from two to 3 p.m. So we hope to see you all there. Our upcoming meeting, or our next community meeting is February 12th, featuring It Did Happen Here, an anti-fascist people's history of Oregon, or Portland, I should say, uh, with special speakers, Selena Flores, Mo Baustern, and Mike Crenshaw. So mark your calendars, I hope to see you there. Then also, please, uh, please sign up for the email list. If you wanna know what's going on with Respond to Racism, go to respondtoracism.org. We have a thing, you just gotta scroll not even halfway down the page, maybe not even to like a new like uh, thing, <laughs> but sign up, you'll be in tune with everything that's going on, whether it be community meetings, uh, new content. We have a project, Life After the Bubble, which features interviews with students of color from 
different generations of uh, Lake Oswego schools, and we're doing new interviews or releasing new interviews every month. So it's very informative. It's not just trauma stories, it's stories of what people built in spite of this town, built in spite of uh, what's happening in the school district. And it's, I think, very informative. It's very good for also keeping the stories of what people have done in this town alive. So highly encourage you all to check that out. And lastly, if you'd like to support this work, because the big thing we're also doing this year is building capacity. So, you know, I'm, uh, I guess, technically our first uh, full-time employee because what we're doing here is actual work, and we want to build that. We want to bring on more people. We're able to just hire a communications consultant at the beginning of this year, but we need more people to be able to do this work consistently so it's not just hanging by a thread, so it's not just the work of, you know, dedicated volunteers, but, you know, a well-oiled machine so we can build this infrastructure. So please go again to respondtoracism.org, donate so we can help bring on more employees, uh, provide more services, bring on more great speakers like our, our special presenter for the, tonight. So I wanna introduce you to Amber Boydston. Amber is a light-skinned black femme, mother of two children, and the founder of Spirited Justice, an abolition, justice education, and mediation organization based in Portland, Oregon, where she was born. Amber's early career began at age 13, working with Clackamas County, providing family mediation and peer mediation training inside of public, private, and higher ed schools, while also mediating inside of and outside of the justice systems. Working with youth, Amber incorporated tools and practices of theater of the oppressed into all conflict resolution training. She has served on the Peace Creepers Board in Oregon, been a regular presenter at the Oregon Mediation Association and Northwest Justice Forum trainings, worked and supported multiple justice-focused programs at Resolutions Northwest, and created curriculum and programming for the Blazers Boys and Girls Clubs. So would you please join me in welcoming Amber Boydston. Thanks, please. Can you all just keep clapping for Bruce, the new ED? I'm so proud of him. I don't know how much closer this needs to be. It keeps turning off there. Um, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here. I wanted to share with you all that during our time together, we're going to talk about what abolition is. We're going to talk about what liberation is, what freedom is. We're going to really start to unpack wealth redistribution. I'm not going to talk too much about reparations, um, just a little bit there. Uh, we'll talk about policing, and I've left space for us to really figure out how we want to move this work beyond theory into practice and then into praxis. Um, I'll make sure to share some definitions, and there will be a break because we end at eight. Um, we're gonna have two breakout groups. You get to choose your breakout groups. I will have some questions that will prompt you in discussion. Um, three questions per breakout group. Um, we'll share back as a whole group um, and then end together. So that's a little bit of what the overview looks like. Um, Bruce did, uh, I, I always wonder what bio I've sent, so he read that one. I'm like, oh, that's, my, that's what I was gonna share with you all. Um, uh, my eldest is 14, my youngest is five. I'm in my 40s, um, and uh, I was born in Portland. I lived on the East Coast from three to 10 on a 40-acre farm, um, and that was, uh, um, radicalizing for many reasons, um, the work with the land, uh, being a light-skinned black person with um, an Ethiopian father and an Irish mother um, lent itself to a different experience. Um, I talk a lot about being a light-skinned person and my access um, with Eurocentric features, and I always name that I have a white mother because there are a lot of light-skinned people out there that have two black parents, and, and that matters. It matters the ways in which I see the world, the ways in which I, I grow the work that I'm doing, and, and just also how I look. But I'm curious, uh, before I launch in too much, are there people here that are here for the first time with Respond to Racism? Awesome. Okay, great. 
Thank you. And then, and then people who have been here before, you all have been supporting for a while. That's wonderful. OK, great. Um, so let's start by just talking a little bit about what abolition is. I'm wondering if anybody has um, any ideas. Do you want to just like raise a hand if you have an idea? You don't have to tell me what that idea is, but do you, do you have a sense of what abolition is? Anybody? Have you heard the word before? All right, I'm going to read an actual definition because I like to, um, I like to just talk, but I think definitions really matter. <laughs> Um, so when we talk about abolition, we're talking about an action or a person responsible for the elimination of systems, practices, and institutions. A lot of times when people think about abolition, they think about um, the prison industrial complex, or they think about different systems that are in existence today that oppress marginalized groups of people. And um, that is really true. Uh, oftentimes people think that abolition is a little bit archaic, um, that it, it doesn't really serve a place in today's world. And so that's my job today is to help you all see that there are still so many threads of the ways in which um, we have decided to put policies and practices in place that are um, serving very few and um, are working really well. And so, as we do this work today, um, and hopefully pass today, I just want you all to really remember that um, this is gonna keep turning off first, <laughs> um, that the systems that are in place today are working really well. They are set up to do exactly what they're doing, and um, it's our job to figure out if we're in agreement with those practices, and if we want to be agents of change and what that looks like. Um, our brain needs oxygen. It doesn't really function well without oxygen. So as we talk about this work, if it starts to feel overwhelming, uncomfortable, stressful, I just want to remind you all to practice taking that breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. I work a lot with young people and adults and um, we don't always remember when we start to get really stressed out that, that we just need to take a breath. Um, I do want you to sit in your discomfort. I was talking with a, a comrade a little bit earlier and um, they were reminding me to remind you all that sitting in discomfort is actually beneficial. Um, and what's really beautiful about tonight is we all are choosing how much we wanna sit in that discomfort. And then for many of us, um, we get to go home and, and not worry about it until we choose again to be uncomfortable. And for some of us, uh, light-skinned, marginalized groups of people, um, elderly, disabled, um, and those are visible, invisible disabilities, um, richly melanated, um, queer, all of us, we are always uncomfortable. And so I just invite you all today, as much as you feel like you can, to show up and be in a space um, that pushes you past your boundaries a little bit for just everyone's liberation. Yeah. Um, I do also um, want to make sure that everyone knows that um, we can stop, we can take a break, you can ask me questions, you can shout out. Uh, I typically have a sitting in a circle, but since we are in a church, that's not really possible right now. But I don't want there to be a, a feeling that I am um, speaking at you. I very much want you all to be able to raise a hand or ask me to stop, um, and, and I'm happy to continue um, moving at a pace that works well for everyone. I don't mind, no. So uh, Webster's Dictionary says, abolition is the action, act, or person responsible for the elimination of a system, practice, or institution. Often when I speak, uh, I use the word praxis. Um, and praxis in definition is your day-to-day -day practices that are distinguished from theory that make up who you are. So we hope to have daily practices 
that are reflective of our integrity and our values, and that leads to our everyday praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S. And I might talk a little bit about carceral systems. Um, it's relating to beliefs and practices of nature and prison or jail, born from a prison or jail mindset. I'll talk about systems of oppression, including structures and institutions and practices that are designed to prevent people from having personal choice, agency over their personal being. So when we think about abolition, um, we're gonna think about it a little bit as an umbrella and everything that falls underneath that umbrella, um, we're gonna tease apart a little bit today. Um, the work that I do as an educator with my organization, Spirited Justice, I talk about myself as a somatic abolitionist. And the reason why I frame it that way is because I understand that there are a lot of epigenetic changes that take place based on our environment and what we experience as individuals. And um, epigenetic changes happen to us irregardless of um, our ethnic background. It is really um, how we live our life and where we live our life and, um, and the patterns and the belief systems and all of that change up our chemical makeup inside of us. And so when I think about abolition work as an educator, I think about how am I embodying the practices that help to dismantle, to take apart the systems that are working really, really well to oppress over 85% of the people in this world. When you talk about a global majority, we're talking about melanated people all over the world, over 85% of us. And so when we think about the minority, often they say, oh, the global minority and, and the image is black or brown person. But really, the global minority is white people. I, I come from them too, my Irish mother. Um, and, and so it is important that we first can place what's happening in the world as a norm. And in the world as a norm, there are more melanated people. Although, as a norm, these people are oppressed. And most of these systems that are in place were set in place prior to any of us existing. Although, many of us, I'm sure not us in here, but many of us globally are complicit in these systems and thus we continue to uphold these systems that really do um, create an inability for our young people to even dream. And it creates uh, an inability for young people who experience trauma um, or adverse childhood experiences um, to get out of those fight or flight or freeze modes or fawn modes in their minds. And they actually then go on to live in those systems within themselves of stress. Um, and if they have children, they bear children in those stressful spaces. And so when I think about the work that I do, and I say I'm an abolitionist, a somatic abolitionist, I'm looking at not only what's happening historically and what's happening in real time, but what's happening internally as well. Um, and, and how do we work on that? Because that really, really matters. Ah, you're amazing. <laughs> Bruce is amazing in all ways. Um, I don't know how to change that. I don't know how to. Yeah, that's great. Um, <laughs> another world is possible when we refuse the inequities of this one. I think that often people, uh, when they think about abolition, and we talk about maybe um, defunding the police or changing the way that um, uh, housing. Um, supports people, or the ways in which we support people in the medical industry, right? Um, or even banks. Um, there's, there's a lot of stress around the what if. How, how would we do it? How are we gonna get there? Um, and, and what are we gonna do with the rapists? Like there's a lot of um, high level like red flags that go off. Um, and I want us to really consider that at whenever you all believe there was a beginning of time with humans, whatever your belief systems are or are not, um, we were dreaming up lots of systems and practices. And we dreamt up new systems and practices, so much so women can use public restrooms now. 
and so much so women can be doctors. Um, so much so people can identify the way that they know they are. Um, we have always been dreaming new worlds. And so um, when we think about abolition, we think about what it might look like to not have carceral systems that oppress people, um, what it might look like not to fund systems and groups that oppress people. Um, when we start to feel that stress, remember, take your breath, and then remember that we actually have a universal practice of dreaming new worlds into existence. And so it is, um, as we have this conversation as a group, it's going to be that balance of understanding our history and how it got us to where we are today, and then being open enough to continue to dream new worlds into existence. Because in real time, we have genocides taking place. Um, we have children who um, are really at the mercy of our decisions as adults. And I remember being young, and I remember thinking um, how adults really didn't understand how easy it could be. And now as an adult, in my 40s, I still feel very much that way, that we as adults really don't understand how easy it could be, um, but in real time, children are dying in the Congo, in Palestine, um, in Tigray. Um, I could keep naming places, I'm sure you all know. Um, and so I want you all to stay open to the possibility of a new world, and new worlds, and what that looks like. Um, and really being attached to identifying your values. What are your values? And how do your everyday practices align with your values? Um, any questions so far? Okay. Um, so when you get to a spot where you feel stuck and thinking about like, how do I change this world? I want you just to get creative and dream. Our thoughts have frequencies. They align with like frequencies. That's science. And so you can align your thoughts in a way that actually help create um, a different pathway for your brain to scan the world. And it can start to scan the world and attach those frequencies to other like frequencies. We can actually start to make change in ways that um, maybe aren't visible in the moment, but momentum that then we can see. It's important for us to recognize that um, we have had a continuous, as, as, as people who, who are living in, on Turtle Island in the US here, um, we have had a continuous uh, push to oppress marginalized groups of people. That we can talk about times of enslavement for sure. Um, it's also important that we understand that during the late 1600s and 1700s, we had night watchmen and we had day watchmen, and those people were protecting property. And when those systems um, were, seemed insurmountable, when there were too many people that were free, then we had to move more to a police force. In the South, we have had slave patrols. And in the South, we went from having um, people who were enslaved to people who were still enslaved, trying to escape enslavement, um, hostages. And, um, and, and we would have slave patrols that would, would hunt enslaved people, and they would bring them back to enslavement. And out of that was in Boston, primarily, was born a police force. Um, and, and those police forces, different than, um, and, and, and I encourage you all to do a little bit of work around just understanding policing from the 1600s to the 1800s. Um, because it looked different depending on what part of the US you were in, or, or what part of the world, really. Um, but what's important to understand is that in the South, we were really, really focused on people as our property. And in other parts, in, in the East and the West, there was a focus on property. Um, and an extension of that was people. 
And so we have these two tracks that are running at all times, which is really still just oppression of, of marginalized groups of people, but born from enslavement and born from this idea that um, we have to control, we have to protect our property over humans at all costs, unless we own those humans and then we own those people like property. And again, we have to protect that. Um, and I say protect really loosely because there's no protection for a hostage. Um, you know, children were, were forced to have children at 13. Um, and, and the abuse was just uh, unbelievable. And so again, when we talk about um, somatic work, we think about what, and, and I'm sure you all in all of your lives have stories from your families um, of trauma. And unless we're working through that trauma, it sticks in our body. It really stays in our body. And there's a lot of researchers that have done work around mammals and what they do when they're stressed. And every mammal except for humans shakes it off. Shake it off. Or they'll like get really big. And humans just, we lock up. And that um, inability to move any of that through us actually creates a newness to who we are. It changes our cellular makeup. Um, so it's important to understand that we have continuously for hundreds and hundreds of years had practices put in place to really um, make sure that uh, black, brown, indigenous people, marginalized groups of people um, do not have any access to their sovereignty. Um, and when we talk about our sovereignty, we're really talking about our, um, our human rights, our human rights to exist with our own thoughts and our ideas our, our belief systems and our practices over our bodies, our belief systems and practices with our minds. Um, and so these systems that have been put in place uh, have been upheld um, and supported and, uh, and now sort of like reign free in, in any institution that you'll walk in, whether it's an educational institution, um, whether it's a medical institution, um, any place that you are going to go to really get support that is funded <laughs> by the government, by the city, by the county, um, supported by the minority, um, is going to have systems of oppression weaved into it. And not only systems, but then policies and then practices and beliefs. And, and then that, that tends to extend into our families. It extends into the things that we say and what we don't say, the ways that we choose to show up or not show up um, to support one another. And, and so we can almost say that it is, uh, it's, um, it's inextricable from our existence, um, this level of anti-blackness. And there is this uh, saying that I really love that um, racism is not the shark, it's the ocean. And, and that we are all swimming in it. It's not one thing that comes and like gets us. So we're all swimming in it, right? So, so me, even as a light-skinned black person, if I see uh, a situation where there's um, an inequality taking place, where there's oppression, and I don't say anything about that, even as a marginalized person myself. I'm upholding a system and a belief, and that continues, right? Like my silence actually is giving this situation um, a green light, a thumbs up. And I could, as, uh, you know, I, could, I could give all the reasons why maybe me speaking up doesn't feel safe or right. I'm a, a woman, my size, my, all these things. But the idea that racism is in the water is that I am impacted in real time and have a choice in real time. I have a choice in real time to make a difference and I have a choice in real time to continue to uphold 
what's taking place. Um, and so to just remember that, that it's not something that is, is only touching certain people. When I talk about anti-blackness or racism, I'm not just thinking about white people. Um, I am, I'm thinking about how all of us are swimming in it and how some of us, white people and light-skinned people, how we have a much larger responsibility. And I say we because I lump myself into that. Um, we have a much larger responsibility to um, speak up, um, to be relentless in the pursuit of abolishing um, these practices that, that really just hurt everybody. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the next slide is, but I'm sure it's great. Wait, what was the one before that? <laughs> it was the one before that. <laughs> Yeah. Although I like Baldwin. Okay. Abolition is not a passive act. It is daily commitment to actively seek ways to dismantle the oppressive systems that exist within and outside of ourselves. It's not a buzzword. A commitment to practice harm reduction in our daily lives. Yeah. Um, I love this because it just is a call to us to do this work um, relentlessly in the conversations with our friends, in the conversations with our family, um, at the grocery store, uh, when we're at the bank, when people think that it's okay to make those little jokes that actually aren't really funny, or they think it's okay to um, just make fun of somebody, or it's okay to talk about something that we know is um, absolutely antithetical to supporting someone's sovereignty. Uh, when we think about abolition as um, an, act, an action that we are taking every day, it reminds us to continue to sit in that level of discomfort for someone else's liberation. Um, when I work with young people, sometimes I'm one of the only adults that's really, like in a school, in, in a school, I'll just take one school, sometimes I'm the only adult that's really pausing and saying, let's listen to this young person. I'm talking like 14 or younger. And that's not because other educators don't care. Other educators care deeply. They don't always have um, the know-how or the time or really what they feel like is the ability to stop and say, yes, I want to support this young person, whatever they need in this moment. Um, it actually makes me vulnerable as an adult to be the one adult to be like, can we maybe listen to this child? Because there are systems in place that, that we know, we've grown up with that say, you know, if we go far enough back, children, you know, shouldn't speak unless they're spoken to. If we bring it closer, you know, children should be respecting elders. If we bring it up even, you know, a few more years, it's, it's children should just be following the rules first and raise your hand before, you know, there's all these rules that we've created as adults that make it really challenging for kids to just exist. And their frontal lobes aren't developed. And they're also in an archaic institution that hasn't changed in over 100 years. None of us are riding horses and buggies in here today. But our school systems are still operating with like grading systems from a meatpacking system, with, with teachers that actually don't get the support that they need from their admin, because the admin are straddling the line and they actually don't always have the support that they need. And it's just a top-down failure of a system that's working exactly how it was meant to work. And so when I go and I work with young people and I say, no, let's stop. Can we pause for a moment? Can we check in with this young person? There's a few things that are happening. I'm super uncomfortable sometimes. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes it's really exciting. Um, but one thing for sure is happening, that young person is, is, is hearing someone's on their side. They're experiencing somebody who, who doesn't, and again, out of a conversation I just had, doesn't necessarily need to um, know why, but they're gonna believe that whatever, whatever this young person is saying is important, right? And we can, we can pause for a moment and just hear this young person. And so, I'm interrupting a system, I'm laying a foundation for this young person to let them know that what, what they believe in saying and need to say is important. And I'm also, um, I'm also really showing the other adults this is possible.
sure. I think it is corrupt. Okay. It is archaic and it is corrupt, yes. Um, so just I think that, I think that the first thing that you can do is acknowledge when you see inequities. I think you can acknowledge when you see things that don't sit right. Um, if your school or environment, and again, you don't have to have a child at a school, you don't have to, if, if you're in a neighborhood, you're by a school. So you can care that, that those kids that you don't know well are at least being supported, right? Um, if you hear that there's a, there was a school that had a um, rent a person day for their spirit week. And, and that was really fun for the school prior to them having more black people there. <laughs> and when more black people showed up, it was complicated. But it was a complicated conversation, right? Because everyone had had a lot of fun with that day prior. It got really silly. Um, but it had really real um, impacts for everybody, not just black people, for everybody. Because even white people are part of this society. And some white people don't want to be known as owners. Some white people don't feel comfortable with that being part of their history and they want to change that in their daily practices. Um, so I would say acknowledge, like speak up. Um, I always say support the youth. So there are youth that have ideas that are part of programs that, are, um, that want to see change. And I'm like, go to the school and find them go to a lunch, sign up and, and just volunteer for lunch, for recess, connect, let them know what programs you're a part of or what groups you're a part of, ask them what they would like to see differently. I think that our young people can lead us towards liberation every single day just by their practices. And I don't think we have to be too creative as adults. I think we just ask them and we can follow their lead because we have a lot of power and access. They might not necessarily have the vehicle to get to where they want to go, but they sure as heck know where they want to go and how to get there. So I say ask them specifically. I say push back on your admin. Um, what else? I keep thinking of things. Hello, hello. It's on a little bit. Yeah. Is it? No? Oh. No, so I thought it was on, but you just hear my lapel. That's what's going on. Someone, everyone here is so smart. <laughs> Got this one. Okay. Okay. Bruce has the other one. Okay. I see this working. Oh. Yeah. Young people I work with say that showing up publicly, we might be privately supporting, but showing up publicly, for example, writing letters to LO Review so that students see that publicly that we are supporting marginalized groups um, from the young people that I work with say that that goes so far when we, we might privately tell people that we know or go to admin, but when we're making public statements in public spaces, um, students say that that is really, really powerful to know that there are adults in our community that are um, willing to go out publicly and say that you're disagreeing with this or you're supporting the students in some way. Absolutely. Put your name on it, raise your hand, let them know. Let them know who you, what your face looks like. Like, don't hide. I think that, yes, yes, speak out. You, you had your hand up. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that question as well. Um, I think something I've heard a lot lately is the idea that it's complicated. And, I'm, and in these conversations I'm having with people where sort of where the conversation is starting to dip down to where we don't know what else to say. We just say it's complicated. And don't do anything beyond that. And I want to challenge the idea that it's comp that it's that maybe it's not complicated. It's entrenched. Mm. It's entrenched. But how complicated is it really? Mm -hmm. 
a Rubik's Cube appears very complicated. But when you take it apart, it's really quite a simple device. It's just a matter of you know, getting out of the entrenched idea that this just can't be solved when it actually can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which then begs the question, do we really want change? And I think many of us are comfortable enough. Many of us live in environments where we don't actually see the police that often. I actually stayed at a friend's house. She has a really nice house. I mean, I was there for two weeks house sitting, and I didn't see a police car, because where I live is close to a main road in northeast Portland. Um, so I see police cars all day, every day. But I didn't see a police car for two weeks. And I tell you, my mental health, at the end of that two weeks, like I'd let my kids play farther on the street. I had actually gone and talked with neighbors in a different way. Um, and it was revolutionary for me, even someone that does this work. It was like, oh, this is why white people in nice neighborhoods don't ever want to defund the police because they don't actually see them. So they don't actually see the problem. Like, we really want the neighborhoods to be like this as black people too. We, we don't want to see the police either. Um, I would go a step farther and say, uh, from what I, I don't want anybody, including the police force, but I don't want anybody responding to situations that they're not equipped to respond to. Like, I don't really want my school teachers to have to go and do, um, you know, uh, triage on, you know, a burn victim if that's not what they're, you know, trained to do. I don't, I don't want my person that's serving me um, coffee to have to go and, you know, jump in the water and help someone that's drowning. Like, I want people to be equipped to do the jobs that they're doing, and overwhelmingly police are tasked with jobs that they cannot ever really do well because they are not trained to do it. Um, and in fact, they are trained uh, to really, um, like I said, uphold the systems, but also to identify um, at a much higher level black and brown people as threats and violence and, um, and and then keep the system of, of jail and prisons operating. Yeah. Um, James Baldwin, Uncle James, uh, says, I, I like this saying, if every day I have to wake up and pay for what my ancestors did, so do white people. Um, and then I just wrote, he's inviting us all to consider that the systems in place today were here before we were born. We have a responsibility to make sure they do not continue existing as weapons of oppression. It's up to each of us to help make sure we keep one another safe. And um, I do want to make sure that we understand that safety is an illusion. Um, and I, I did have that first slide up that talks about us as neighbors keeping each other safe. And so when I think about abolition work, one thing that pops into my mind often is how are we interrupting the systems? Right? Because if everything's working exactly how it should be, how are we interrupting everything as it should be? Right? We're, we're not staying silent. We're speaking up. We're putting a face and a name to what we believe, um, listening to the youth. Uh, we are often also making sure that, um, that, that people really know where we stand in our families, um, out and about. Uh, we are making sure that we are really, really vocal in whatever way we can be. Um, and, and we are not ever, um, like if we know that these systems are working really, really well, um, we are at every turn trying to get creative to change. And, and James Baldwin was always somebody, I don't know if, in, any of you have read his work. Um, he was someone who was really, really clear about what was taking place. He didn't really mince words. Um, and he helped people, I think, really just stand in that uncomfortableness. Because once we stand in it, like we get a little dirty, and then we have to do something with that. Um, and so I want us to, I, I, I want us to really consider, like, how do, we, how do we just know that these systems are working great, but we need to interrupt that. 
you need to interrupt what's working great because it's only working great for like four people. <laughs> Um, I do want us to break out into breakout groups here in a moment. Um, I'm trying to think if there's something else I wanted to add to this. Yeah. Um, it, safety is an illusion. One way that I interrupt the systems that are in place is I get to know my neighbors. That's what I was saying, is that first slide. Getting to know your neighbors is like abolition 101. Do you know their names? Do you know a little bit about them? Everyone in your apartment complex or on your floor or in your neighborhood, do you know them? Because if something goes down, something happens, um, nature, human, whatever, um, are you able to get to one another and help each other out. Because the police aren't going to really come and help you. <laughs> They're not going to really come and help you. Um, they might block the ability for you to get your food. We've seen that in some situations globally. <laughs> uh, uh, and we have historical references for that. We know that it's not just one group of people. That if they're coming for me in the night, they're coming for you in the morning. And so, um, do I know the people around me so we can keep each other safe? Do I know that my neighbor um, on the same floor as me also is Habasha? And I know that they have a set of practices that are similar. But the neighbor down a little farther, um, he's just a white guy. <laughs> and he's, he really, really cares about animals. And he's always got like dog food around. Um, None of that matters for me right now, like me as Amber without a dog. But there are other people on my floor that also have dogs. And I know that dogs are really, really intelligent. And they can be really caring and helpful. Um, and they're an important part of our society. And so if something happened in my apartment, I know I got my Habesha people down here that have tons of food. We're going to be able to cook, got all the spices. I know other people, other neighbors have animals. This guy's got dog food. I've heard cats can eat dog food. I don't know. We'll find out. Um, there's other neighbors. I, I, I know one of my neighbors uh, has a mobility device. So when the elevators go down, we got to know who's strong enough to help lift in case of a fire. Do I know their names? Do I have their numbers? Um, because the police aren't really going to show up and be able to do all of that, right? I didn't even name the children. That's just a few of, few of the people on my floor. Um, all of this matters. We might not ever be in a situation like people are in in Gaza. Um, we might not ever be in those situations. We might not ever even be in situations like people downtown Portland that are unhoused, right? We might always be in situations where things work pretty well. We might not ever have a house fire or a tree fall in a neighbor's car or anything that wrecks our world. But it's nice to be prepared. That idea of stay ready so you don't have to get ready. An abolitionist stay ready. We stay ready by interrupting the systems by creating community. Creating community is the one thing that systems, um, the people that uphold systems of oppression and create policy try to pull apart from us. That's why we have short timed lunches that's why there's only short periods of time in prisons and jails where people can get together and, and connect. That's why in school systems, there are rules around the ways in which you connect. So we can interrupt those systems by knowing each other. So that if we do interface with anybody that's in a system of power, we are collectively strong. Um, I'm probably going over, I don't know. Yeah, 701. Everyone, we're going to go into breakout groups. I have three questions for those breakout groups, but I'm wondering, would we like a five-minute break first before we go into the breakout groups? I'm seeing some head nods. Okay, all right. Um, I'm going to stay here. I'm just going to eat a cookie, so if you have questions for me, come up. Um, we'll take a five-minute break. Uh, restrooms are out here to the right. Yep. Um, food is out here to the left. That might be opposite if you're facing me. Yep. It's like theater. Um, I'll see you in five minutes.
uh, 70, let's do 707, yep, 707.
Okay. Oh my gosh. Um, will you give me another splash of coffee? Thank you. I know. Thank you. They didn't have anything, so I just had it black. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. No, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it so much. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Thank you. Do you want me to? Do you want me to get us going, Bruce? We good? Okay. All right, everyone, welcome back. Please continue to get cozy, eat, drink. Uh, we're gonna go in our breakout groups in just a couple minutes here. No, you're fine. No, no, no. Move around. Move around. I, I, I am just, I'll just keep talking while you move. Uh, <laughs> yes, our breakout groups will be like three to four. And you'll have a facilitator come and meet with you. Oh, you're fine. No, no. Now I'm now I'm just equally as distracted. Uh, James Baldwin, works of art up here. Just take a picture. I can send it to you as well. Um, I think something for us to remember as we are trying to figure out how best to show up in this world with our values and our integrity and dismantling these systems is remembering that access to resources really makes a difference access to education, access to funds, access to community, all of that makes a difference. Um, we are better equipped to help with the change that needs to happen when we are a well-resourced community. Um, is Lake Oswego a well-resourced community? Yeah. Yes. We are. You are. Mm -hmm. I just want to that. Please. We're well-resourced. Wait, hold on, you need a microphone. I just wanted to frame that <clears throat> we automatically go to when we say, are they well resourced? So what, what came in our minds? Was that financial? Was that like access to power? Was that well resourced in uh, like community awareness? What, so I just wanted to frame that to make us think, what's that mean? What does that mean? I heard people affirm, yes, they're well resourced. Is it so, money you all have? You have money. What else? Power. Uh huh. Money, power. Um, we have highly educated people here, who are undereducated about what it's going to make to take to make the world be a different spot. And I mm -hmm. think that's what you're mm -hmm. what you're alluding to, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're very under resourced in that area and have okay. a lot of work to do. That's why we're glad you're here. <laughs> with, your, with your resources that you do have, um, 
would it be possible to redistribute those resources in a way that could create a ripple impact of change? Is it a part of your value systems? You don't have to answer this right now. I'm just wondering, like, is it part of your value systems in practice every day to sit with? As we go into our breakout groups, um, I, I want you to keep in the back of your mind the resources that you have access to. I think about this, again, as an adult working with young people. I work with adults, too. I work in universities as well. But when I work with younger people, I have to remember all of my reach. And, and sometimes it's in these ways that I don't even consider that important. Like, I actually do have access to the principal and the parents and the counselors. Like, that's a, that's a lot of things that kids don't necessarily always have the ability to go seek out on their own, right? I also have the ability to make some changes. I could go and talk to somebody, and that makes a big change. I can also leverage funds. There are lots of positions of power that I have that sometimes really don't actually take a lot of energy from me, but has the largest ripple impact in the communities of young people, and then the communities of their families, and then generationally. Even if just generationally, they are hearing a changed narrative of being heard, right? And being heard then leads to a level of access and that access opens up doors of resources. So I want you to consider like, that sometimes, even in Lake Oswego, you all aren't considering the ways in which you could give, not you as you personally, but as a collective, the ways that you could give that maybe are, don't cause a lot of stress or worry on your end, but really has a tremendous ripple impact on the communities that you're a part of in both dismantling systems that were here before you were born, but also creating new pathways for the future. So as we go into our breakout groups, our first questions are really gonna be around um, dreaming about this new world, creating community. We'll come back, we'll share as a group, and then we'll go into another great breakout group, and we're really gonna focus on redistribution of generational wealth and what that means. Um, what that really looks like in practice and how we can attach that to our, our everyday um, ways of living because that really, really matters. Um, I'm going to continue to be relentless for speaking um, up with young people even as I age. When I get into my 50s and 60s and 70s and hopefully 80s and 90s, um, I'll continue to speak up with them because that's a deep value of mine, even if it alienates me from some people, because I know it's gonna help shift a narrative. Um, it's also going to empower the people that need that most. And then in some way, we're all gonna be able to like make our way back into humanity and have humanity, which is something that we lose, something that white people lose with the falsehood of white supremacy, something that we all lose when we don't actually show up for one another. So again, safety is an illusion, but we can create moments of comfort and community that lead to that feeling of safety when we actually do sit in discomfort with other people for our liberation, our growth. So let's get into breakout groups. Um, we really just, again, we're acknowledging these systems in place. They're working exactly how they're meant to be working. Um, these systems of anti-blackness, pulling from these Jim Crow era. Um, and so we get to be a little radical in our thinking today, if we want to be. A little radical in thinking what this new world would look like. Um, our first question is going to be, once you get into your breakout groups, what would a perfect world look like for you? Who is included? Who and what are excluded? That's the first question. Yeah. Bruce. Yeah, so quickly for your uh, breakout groups. So you're mostly kind of like situated with the three or four people around you, but we need like a couple people to migrate to the two groups over here. Don't all jump up at once. <laughs> or this group will be going back there, but. So we have a few uh, facilitators positioned throughout. Uh, Jan over here, Sheree over there, Sienna is up there. 
and Nancy behind me. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so whoever would like to come back to, or actually up front here, someone please join Jan's group. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, go go ahead with Jan. Uh, okay, this one might be a little. Uh, we're trying to do like smaller. Uh, okay. Whatever, whatever works. Well, we can make it easy. If you're online, oh. <laughs> yeah. If you're online. Uh, I want you to sit with these questions or journal these questions. Um, however you want to process these questions, they're still really, really important for us to sit with as individuals, even if you aren't in a breakout group. Um, so first one is, what would a perfect world look like for you? Who is included and who and what are excluded? For this question, uh, about five minutes for this question. For this question, <laughs> because now I'm
which I'm sure we could sit with for a long time. I want us to think about what does community mean to you in your daily practices? Um, and can these spaces be built in silos? So the question whether you're um, in person or online is what does community mean to you in daily practice? Can these spaces be built in silos? This is your thing. I like this. I like this Where's director. The Next question.
All right, lovely people. As you are wrapping this up, please continue as you need to. Our third question doesn't really, shouldn't take too long to answer. I just want you to sit with and then give some feedback to your group. When are you prompted to speak out about oppression? Youth, elders, marginalized communities, etc. When do you hold back and why? So whether you're online or in person, just think for a moment before you give that answer. When are you prompted to speak out about oppression? And when do you hold back and why? Just about two minutes for this and we'll come back as a full group. All right, wrap up where you can within the next 30 seconds. Hmm? Is my mic up? I think so. Okay. All right, everyone, let's wrap up within the next 30 seconds here. All right, wherever you are, we're gonna just come back as a whole group here. Um, or if you can quietly finish your last thoughts there with your group. I think these are topics we could spend a lot of time talking about. So I want you to, whether you're at home or in person, to consider just uh, sitting with these questions again and again throughout this month and next month. Um, one of the people in our chats online asked if I use the term melanated uh, um, as opposed to using color, like person of color. 
Um, I don't use person of color personally. Uh, that's not a term that I use, although it is a term that lots of people feel comfortable with, POC. I use the term melanated because uh, it is a, in alignment with people who have melanin in their skin. And so when we think about the global majority, it is melanated, people with melanin in their skin, black, brown, indigenous people across the world. So please, you know, um, I'm a big fan of asking questions and getting corrected um, and being vulnerable. Um, I'm also a light-skinned black person, so I'm in uncomfortable situations often, so I have a practice of being uncomfortable. So it might be something you need to jump into, but please feel free to ask community, how do you identify, and let them know how you identify, because you might find someone that says, no, I only use POC. So just, I, I use that term for that reason. Um, I am wondering if anybody wants to share something that feels salient or, I don't know, moving from your group before we move on to our next breakout group. Questions? Anything that came up for you, an awareness, a thought, an idea that you want to share? And it's okay if not. One of the things we talked about was the recent survey in LO, and 94% of the people said that they were so happy with LO, with everything about it, the police, community services and such. And then the questions were, who answered the survey? Mm. And who had, who had access to the survey? Yeah, and so um, that was a very interesting thing, talking about when you're trying to paint a picture of a society, uh, what is it really based mm. on? Yeah, mm -hmm. so that was an interesting kind of thing that came out. Um, and then another person was saying, she's from Northeast Portland, mm. and after the George Floyd murder, they were, um, they had meetings, you know, and the people were really passionate, especially the white people. Mm -hmm. The black people didn't get really heard because mm. they have a different way of communicating. So mm. talking about being willing to slow down mm. if you're the one that's in the majority and be patient mm -hmm. and hear things. Yeah. You say ask, ask questions. Ask questions. But thank you. I was just going to say that. One of these thank areas you. was ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes. No, that's spot on. Ask questions. We, we don't ever want to be people that move into an environment and just see all the things that could be changed in our, in our perception and then move to make those changes. We do want to ask the people that actually live there and are thriving there or not thriving there um, what we can do to show up for them. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, uh, I mean, I think this is a perfect segue in, in just with what you said, this survey. I mean, because I'm curious, the percentage of white people that live here and who had access as well, although that begs the question, um, what did redlining look like? And, um, and are the people that are here everybody who wants to be here? Um, are there people that would like to live here that don't have access to living here? Or is this an environment that other people in other areas would like to have replicated to some, to some respect, right? Um, when we think about uh, the concentrated amount of generational wealth in Lake Oswego, it's pretty profound. And it continues to stay that way because it is kept within its own communities. Similar to philanthropy. Philanthropy is a $500 billion business, and it is that way because the money stays within the communities. It is a falsehood that it actually goes out to the groups of people that are doing harm reduction work. It doesn't in, in small amounts, which lots of times people feel like is a lot if they don't understand the difference between thousands and millions and billions. And so when you have billionaires giving out thousands or millions, it's like grains of sand. It's not a lot. And so we can consider in this area what it's like for us as individuals and as a community practice, right? That might look differently. We might have individual household practices that are very different from our friends and our communities. But what does it look like when we consider how we actually show up and redistribute what we have with access, with wealth, with time for that butterfly, that ripple impact, um, to actually help create change. And again, remembering, none of us were here when the systems were created. But like James Baldwin said, if every day he wakes up and he has to pay for what his ancestors did, so do white people. 
White people don't get to say, but I'm not an owner right now. I didn't come from a family that was. I actually love black people. That's, that's not enough. It's not enough for me to go into a school with young people and be like, I like you, and then not ever actually listen to their needs and take it a step farther and, and do something to change their way of life every day. So our next set of questions are around redistributing our generational wealth. And I want us to really sit with these questions. We don't have hours, but we do have minutes. And in those minutes, we can get really, really creative with, with aligning our values and our practices to something much larger, which is changing systems that are working really well and are killing most. All right, so as we get into our groups, the first question, and I just, I want you all to maybe think about it and then give a 30 second answer within your group. What did wealth redistribution or giving look like when you were growing up? So I'll say for myself, with my Irish grandmother, um, she was part of like Meals on Wheels. And, and she was a big, her church, her Madeline Church in Northeast Portland was a big part of her life. And so we were always going around and um, giving out food in neighborhoods supporting in houses with elderly people, um, supporting and, and giving out you know, goods within her church community. Um, with my Ethiopian side of my family, um, we also were working in schools. I have a lot of educators on that side of the family, so we we're in schools figuring out what, what families needed often and matching needs and resources to that. Um, we also had a daily practice of just giving in whatever way we could like whatever way we could. We didn't walk by people and see a need without addressing it. Even if it was just a, I can't give you money right now. My name's Amber, what's your name? I hope you have a beautiful day. Like we tried to address people with a level of humanity wherever. So that would, that would be my quick 30 second, that's what it looked like growing up for me. All right, go ahead.
want you to consider just always how your foundation has shaped your belief systems and your practices. Um, we are going to move on to the next question, though, and I have this broken out. So you get to choose how you identify, which you already know. <laughs> the question is, if you are white, white people, listen, what are the ripple impacts of redistributing generational wealth to communities of the global majority? So when I'm talking about communities of the global majority, I'm talking about black, brown, indigenous, POC identifying groups of people. If you're white, what are the ripple impacts in your mind of redistributing generational wealth to these communities? And when I say that, I also want to share something a friend said recently, which was, uh, as humans, we need to stay in our lanes. So often we, as humans, want to do the most. And sometimes our jobs can be very simple. Uh, this conversation was coming out of us applying for grants. And when we got grants, each different organizations, those grant funders having these very specific uh, requests of how these funds were allocated. And she was saying to me, I wish I could just say stay in your lane. Like you have the funds, we're doing the work on the ground. We know how to allocate those funds, like trust us, right? Trust that we have the job on this end, you have the job on that end. The job on that end is to give the money in trust to the communities to do the work with it. Not to delegate how it's used, not to have control and stress over if and when and how it might be or oh, it wasn't used that way, but just to give because that's within your capacity. And it's within the other people's capacities to do the work. Um, so, if you are white, listening here, there, your question is, what are the ripple impacts of redistributing generational wealth to the communities of the global majority? You actually don't even have to figure out what happens past that. Just what are the ripple impacts? You don't even have to figure out like how you do it. For uh, some melanated, black, brown, indigenous, POC identifying, what are the ripple impacts of keeping generational wealth within your own families or communities? So what are the ripple impacts of keeping that money within your community? Five minutes, let's talk.
Okay, I know that was a heavy question, that was a big question, and you all are still working your way through it, although I, uh, I'm trying to keep us on time, not that successfully. We're getting closer towards eight. <laughs> We're like inching our way there. Um, I always love to remember, that's, a, that's an odd sentence. Um, I do appreciate when I remember that doing the work in our own communities has the largest ripple impacts. So I have family in Gondor and Ethiopia. I can, you know, obviously send money over there and um, that's great. Uh, it does have a larger impact when I, when I send it just in my own city, outside of my own city, in my state, to something that's happening, to communities that are doing the work. In, in my neighborhood. I also have a better chance of being able to support in real time to make sure that those dollars, energy, all of that is going to the right places. So as we're considering just how to use our funds, how to keep our funds, how to allocate, redistribute, just remember it doesn't need to go far. Close in is great. Um, not necessarily close in as like Lake Oswego. Okay, but <laughs> <laughs> Close in Oregon. Um, okay, I want us to do this last question as a group here for time's sake and also for community. So if you want to move back to a place, please do. Um, if you want to stay where you are, whatever feels best. Um, yes. Yes, 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 absolutely, 100%. Um, also, this slide up here is just a, just a handful of books about um, abolition. Um, there might be some new names up there, some uh, new names as new authors, rather, some um, established authors as well, uh, some authors that have passed on. Um, all great books. I've read them all. Um, and then more books. All right. So this question is for our whole group here. What does giving in proximity to our values look like from day to day, year to year? So online or in person, what does giving in proximity to our values look like day to day and year to year? So just sit with that. And if you died tomorrow, would you be proud of yourself? Were you relentless in the pursuit of a collective liberation? Can we be people that give privately and publicly? How can we be agents of change within our personal boundaries? And lastly, what does it look like to live slightly outside of our comfort zone for the betterment of all? So when we think about giving in proximity to our values day to day, if today was our last day or this week is our last week, are we doing this in alignment? to the best of our ability? Can we do this privately and publicly? It's nice to give publicly. It's also nice to do some things privately and not share. Maybe we talk about it within our communities a little bit, but not a lot. Is that part of our value system as well? To give and not make it a public thing, not post about it, not share pictures of the people that we gave to, because we all need help sometimes. So just, does anybody have any thoughts? What does giving in proximity to your values look like day to day? Or what do you want it to look like? One thing I can think of offhand, list goes on, but to to vote with the consciousness that it may not always be in my own personal best interest. Mm. Mm -hmm. Good 
could feel the, really is, I could feel the discomfort there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when in fact it is, right? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts that people want to share? You know, I'll just say that I think the question of public and private is really important, and I really believe um, we organize with a group whose loved ones have been killed by police, mm -hmm. and they've taught me so much about um, turning private shame into public pain, mm -hmm. and or turning pri did I say that? yeah, I think that's right you know, to grieve publicly. And I think we're seeing that, you know, online with people recognizing what's happening in the genocides around the world. And so I'd love to find ways to encourage more white folks to show up in their grief because mm. we feel it deeply and yet maybe we have fear about doing that publicly and certainly people are getting consequences for doing that publicly. But if we, more and more people do that, I think that um, that's what makes real change. So I've just been thinking about that comment about showing up publicly for the kids, you know, and I think I'm a mom. I got a 15-year-old, like, it's what it's all about, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the idea of not wasting your hate, but rather gathering and creating um, and being of service in this way, so not letting that fire overcome, and, and but channeling it, yeah. Um, I want you all to remember that Oregon was designed specifically to be a white utopia. And Lake Oswego is like a mega white utopia. Um, it's not a place I ever come and feel comfortable. There are people here that I feel comfortable with. There's places that historically I've been to, because I'm in my 40s and I was born in Oregon, that feel great. Um, I am light enough skin that being outside in the outdoors actually is a little safer for me. So there are parts of this area that I'm in right now that I'm like, yeah, this is cool. None of my richly melanated friends showed up. And I have to acknowledge that that is probably because this is a representation of what our state was supposed to look like. And I really believe that everybody in here and many people outside of here that live in Lake Oswego, that own homes in Lake Oswego, don't actually prescribe to that narrative. I, really, I know that, because I know that I have white family members that don't prescribe to the idea that they are supreme in any way. But it would be a misnomer if I didn't acknowledge that Oregon really is designed to operate very much how Lake Oswego looks. And so you all have a really, really beautiful opportunity, and I would say a responsibility, but you get to choose, an opportunity to change that. You have an opportunity to be something that we would actually want to see and believe in. Yes, sir. So a little bit of history. Yes. Um, city council meeting. Yes and met with one of the council people after the meeting, and I said, you know, you can't sell your house to me. And she about fainted, what do you mean? I said, you can't sell your house to me. I make a bet on that. So you tell me, you, you take a look at your papers and we'll get together next time around. The result of what ended up happening was legislation was proposed in Salem to outlaw the exclusionary clause in all of the property deeds in the state, because all the deeds had exclusion clauses, and a lot of people didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the greatest, well, you actually gave me the terminology of um, having access to white privilege. And as I mentioned before, if I were raised in the family I was born in, I would identify as black. I was adopted and I, into a Caucasian family, and it's, 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 been, a, it's been a thing. But anyway, um, one of the things that, as getting involved with some of the protests, a lot of the protests, 
actually over time, I would listen to people who would talk about things in a way that were not my experience, and I had a hard time believing, or I had a hard time feeling empathy for, because I was like, if you would just, I caught, caught my thought process, if, if you would just, or how could you have that particular attitude, or how could you have, and what I was able to find within me was the genero- enough generosity to be, to give the, to give the, have the generosity to be uncomfortable, to really just stay in my boots when I was standing there out in that grass or whatever it was and just give, be generous enough to, to be so uncomfortable in what I was hearing that I got to hear more, that I got to listen to more people speak, I got to listen to you speak, I got to listen to all these different people speak and as I started putting together these different scenarios that was not the way that I lived, it started making more sense. Mm-hmm. It'll never be the, my personal experience. Mm-hmm. But I came to a place through being willing to be uncomfortable enough for long enough, Mm -hmm. and that took generosity. And I hate to put it that way in a way, but it really was me saying, just just stick with it. Because there is no way that all this is happening out of nothingness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is all happening out of something real. I just don't get it yet. And it'll never be my experience, but I can sign up to be patient enough to listen long enough and to participate long enough that I will vote differently, I'll act differently, I'll be quiet more often. And that's, that's a big factor as well, just listening and, and, and being willing to accept that that's somebody else's reality. Yeah. Right? Thank you. Yeah. So just one thing I heard you talk about a lot is just staying curious. Yeah. yeah. Stay curious. Um, stay quiet. Keep educating yourself. Those things matter. Those things really, really matter. Yeah. Um, Bruce, <laughs> do you have anything? <laughs> I, can, I can wrap us up here, but I don't know before that if there are any questions that I should be answering. Or, yeah. um, the definition of abolitionist. Yeah. Um, yes. When I looked it up, it was all about slavery. Yes. And they don't mention anything else that you've been talking about. And I was talking to my wife about that. And she said, you know why? Because it was written by white men. (laughs) You know, the definitions, you (laughs) know. But it's all pertaining to slavery. Written by white men, upheld by white women. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, Um, I can, I'll send these slides to Bruce so we can send them everywhere. And then also, um, I'll cite all the sources. Yeah, I have that on my definitions as well. Yep, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, It is not radical to be an abolitionist at all. There's nothing radical about that. We're just inviting people to be humans again, you know, to remember that we're all human. We're sentient beings. We all matter. Um, That black people matter. That brown people matter. That indigenous people matter, really. We know that white people matter because it's written in our policies and our practices, and we have neighborhoods like this. Um, But we don't know necessarily that black people matter, richly melanated black people rather. Um, And we should know our history so that we understand who's in our prisons, who's in our jails, who's running our government, um, who our teachers are. Should know who your teachers are. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and, And just think about if if tomorrow, tomorrow was your last day, how can you show up at a higher level but keeping it in alignment with who you are? Staying in your lane, not looking in other neighborhoods to just go in and make the change, but to go in support with what resources you have, right? If I have an excess of jackets, I might also want to figure out how people get pants, but I should probably just show up and give the jackets. Partner with somebody else who knows where to find the pants. Yeah, so I have access to funds. If I have access to opening doors, that's what I do. I don't have to do more than that. There are people already in your neighborhood, in your city, in your state, in your country, and outside of this country that are doing really, really good work with and for people. And so you can partner with those people, or you can reach out and ask them to support. I know I have a few more slides here, so I will move them through them quickly. Audre Lorde said, there's no single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. 
And as Sata Shakur said, nobody in the world, nobody in history, has ever gotten their freedom by appealing to the moral sense of the people who were oppressing them. Yeah. Um, and your relationships are activism too. Yeah. It's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to be embarrassed. It's okay to make mistakes. You probably expect that because you're human. Whatever your belief system is, God force energy within you, God beside you, no God, whatever it is, we are all here and we can all do better um, and we're gonna make mistakes and that's how we learn. We fall forward. Yeah, you fall, you fall, move forward, you pick yourself up. You ask for grace from your community. You know you have good friends when they check you. You know you have people that don't care when they don't check your poor behavior. So when you have people that check in with you, do that. Check in with your friends, ask them how they're spending their money. Ask them where they're donating. Ask them if they have a donation line item every week or every month. Does it change? Do we have our favorite Negroes that we donate to or do we donate to a broad community of people? And I use that term for a reason because often we can get fixated on certain people doing certain work and we just wanna to give to them. And so how can we be expansive in our giving? I could talk forever about this, but we are absolutely over our time. Um, any questions for me right now? Any thoughts? Anything I didn't touch on? Capitalism is bad. <laughs> um, black capitalism is bad too. Um, uh, I think, we should, I think we should really be radicalized by what we're seeing happening around the world with young people in terms of genocide. And I think that we should let that radicalize us because it is a test if they can do it to us. And they have been doing it for people for many, many years in many places of the world, longer than we've been alive. So we have to really be deliberate with our actions because it can happen on our soil. Um, and irregardless, it just shouldn't be happening. Shouldn't be happening to children. Children should know that adults can create systems of community that lead to safety. Um, so thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for letting me talk over time. Um, thank you for sitting with uncomfortable questions. I hope when you hear the word abolition again, you can tell people it's nothing radical. It's really just acknowledging these systems are working exactly how they should be. And that oppression is not anything that I you know, personally want to prescribe to. Um, and I'm going to work hard to dismantle that at every turn. Um, in my belief systems and in the way that I move through this world, how I breathe, what I choose to listen to, what I choose to watch, who I choose to give my time and my energy to. Is it primarily white people? Is it a gr diverse group of people? Because we need diversity everywhere. Um, I know that because I am multiple. I come from multiple environments um, to make up me. So I don't think it just is going to take white or black people. I think it's going to take us all um, sitting in discomfort for our liberation. Um, and, and I hope you all stay uncomfortable longer than just today and just tonight. I hope you sit in discomfort every day, all day. Um, and I hope you ask marginalized groups of people how you can show up with and for them. I hope you donate a lot. I hope you redistribute wild amounts that just make you super uncomfortable, but actually create change. Um, you want to give in proximity uh, to a way that that moment and that day changes your life, and in that moment and that day changes the other person's life. So it's probably not $10, although it might be for some white people. This isn't the environment here but in some communities it is, just giving $10. Um, in some communities it's more, and so just consider that. Um, and have fun with your life. Have fun, I keep dreaming. Mm. I hope you come back. Oh, thank you, I hope to come back, <laughs> hope to come back. Um, I hope you all keep dreaming and imagining. That's the biggest thing. To be an abolitionist is to someone um, who can really keep that spark, right? When we think of times of enslavement, people were still having jokes. They were still joking. They were still laughing at times. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. It was, it was not a level of cognitive um, 
uh, it was not a disassociation that was happening cognitively. It was an integration of our full humanity. And so while we acknowledge that in real time today, there are babies and children dying, in real time today, we can create ideas that are a pathway to new realities. And hopefully in the future, less children are dying by adult choices, if that makes sense. All right, live your sovereign lives. <laughs> yes. yes. That's the meeting, everyone. Good night. <laughs> Someone get a picture of us. Oh. <laughs> I don't, no one's taking a picture. No, it has to be no, your parents. <laughs> Now everyone take a picture. Wait, I don't, we don't need the cup. Okay. Okay. Oh. Oh, oh we have to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is all for you, Bruce. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my god. Only 14 minutes over. Okay. <laughs>